Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 16122 in the name of Alison Harris on early years. And I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. And I call on Alison Harris to speak to and move the motion. Ms. Harris, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I move the motion in my name. In October last year, when the Scottish Conservatives last brought this topic to the Chamber, we highlighted some very concerning and urgent issues regarding the implementation of the expansion to 1140 hours of funded childcare. These focused mainly on the private, voluntary and independent or PVI sector. These problems were many, but four key issues kept appearing. One, the lack of access to capital funding for expansion in the PVI sector. Two, the lack of partnership between local authorities and the PVI sector. Three, a material variation in the revenue funding rates offered to partner providers across local authorities. And four, the staff drain from the PVI, PVI sector to councils. So what has changed? The Scottish Government and the Minister will say that they've taken actions to address these key issues. However, these have come far too late into the implementation period and for the most part have been of little substance with not much effect. In December 2018, the Scottish Government published a delivery support plan for partner providers. However, in its 20 pages, only two of the new measures in the document actually tried to address the key problems that we highlighted in October. Therefore, these four key issues are still very much outstanding. In terms of access to capital funding for the PVI sector, there has been some progress, but bear with me. Back in October, the majority of local authorities had allocated no capital funding for the PVI sector expansion to 1140 hours. And I asked the Minister to clarify the position on capital funding to each local authority. Her team wrote to all councils on the 14th of November to say that they were permitted to use capital funding for PVI sector expansion. But this was subject to, and I quote, legal and financial restrictions on the ability to use capital funding. This is little help when the confusion around legal and financial restrictions was often the very reason funding was not allocated. However, the recent establishment of the ELC Partnership Forum has allowed for some progress in this respect. Councils like Angus and Murray have successfully devised a working method of allocating capital funding and they have been able to share this process with other local authorities. It seems inconceivable that it took until late 2018 before a successful method of allocating capital funding to the PVI sector was actually shared. Moreover, it took numerous calls from the Scottish Conservatives and other stakeholders before the government intervened to help in this regard, for something that should have been planned for when the policy was announced several years ago. And despite the Scottish Government's letter, I have been informed that some councils are still not allocating capital funding. So this lack of access to capital funding, which was brought up in October last year, is still an issue nearly six months later. So, well, which point? Sorry. Yes, OK. Thank you. Right, More. thank you. Okay, sorry. Yes, uh, okay. Can I just call first rather sorry. than you just have a little I'll conversation? Apologize. Maureen Watt, please. Yes, I wonder if the member is aware that in uh, Aberdeen City Council's budget uh, discussions, the recommendations were of approving funding for the delivery of early learning and childcare expansion and that ministers uh, and the chief officers give the business case in respect of the following projects related to early learning and childcare. East Torrey New Build, That's Northfield a, a quite Park, a long intervention, Tilly Ms. Drone Nursery and Seat Nursery, etc. That is local councils uh, preparing I, for thank it. You. Can I say there is time in hand. You will get your time back. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you for that. There is a variable picture across the whole of Scotland and I am listening to the private sector. The next problem, the next major problem in the rollout that we raised was the lack of partnership between local authorities and the PVI sector. The ELC Partnership Forum has at least introduced a dialogue between councils and the PVI sector, where in some cases no dialogue existed. However, one provider recently told me that some local authorities are unwilling to meet with funded providers who are already in partnership 
or indeed they're only willing to meet when a council-run nursery needs holiday cover. Partnership is vital to the success of the 1140 hours policy and I know the Minister agrees that partnership is vital but it is still not happening in far too many cases and is putting the policy in jeopardy. The Minister said this morning that everything is on target and that the policy will be delivered on time. But this is the opposite to what the PVI sector are telling us. So, Minister, who's wrong? The third key problem is the huge variation in revenue funding rates for the PVI sector. The total revenue funding from the Scottish Government is rising and this is ab obviously welcome but significant variations in funding rates across local authorities still exist. These variations are creating a postcode lottery for partner providers in Scotland. This has implications for partners where the funding rate is lower in their authority. They are prevented by the Scottish Government from charging top-up fees to bridge these funding gaps but the funding rate alone is not sustainable for their businesses to succeed. Yes, sorry. Minister. So I'd just like to clarify with uh, the member, it is currently unlawful, as you say, for um, it to charge parents and carers to top up fees for a child's statutory early learning and childcare hours. And that's a long-standing legal position. It's laid out clearly in statutory guidance, which was passed by this parliament in 2014. That position is reiterated in the new national standard to be introduced from August 2020. Does the member agree that statutory early learning and childcare hours should be free at the point of access? Or is the member Thank advocating you. You. for a change in the law? Ms Harris. Yes, I agree, but it has to be properly funded. This has resulted in these providers now considering pulling out of the partnership and indeed some already have, as we have seen with St George's School in Edinburgh this week. The final key issue is that the, sta the staff drain from the PVI sector to local authorities. The government say that they are encouraging local authorities to promote from within council staffing pools, but staffing is still a major issue. Just last week, a job posting went up on My Job Scotland for a childcare practitioner at North Lanarkshire Council. The typical salary for an entry-level practitioner role is around £20,500. However, this posting advertised for an early-level practitioner, entry, sorry, en entry-level practitioner, with a salary ranging from £25,000 to £29,000. There is no way a PVI sector nursery can compete with this. And if you were a practitioner working in the industry, which job would you be going for? And this is having real knock-on effects on businesses. Recently, one provider lost a manager, a deputy, supervisor, and two qualified staff from one setting in a matter of weeks, with all these staff moving to local authority services for more money, and who can blame them? Meanwhile, the PVI sector's hands are tied with no top-ups allowed, and they can't compete because of the variation in funding rates across Scotland. In many ways, the implementation of this policy is frustrating because we keep hearing from the SNP that everything is on track, partnership is working and everyone is happy. It's just not the case. The, the motion calls for the Scottish Government to urgently intervene to fix these flaws in implementation. If they don't, then we're going to see many more examples of businesses withdrawing from partnership or leaving the sector altogether. And this is only to the detriment of children and parents across Scotland. The Minister has acknowledged that the expansion cannot happen without the PVI sector. And with August 2020 around the corner, there's not much time left to fix this. And that's why I hope the whole Parliament will support my motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Mary Todd to speak to and move Amendment 16122.1. Minister, five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment. In Beg your pardon, six minutes. <laughs> I'll speak more slowly then. In partnership with local government, we've made an ambitious commitment to almost double the funded early learning and childcare entitlement for all three and four-year-olds and for eligible two-year-olds from August 2020. It's heartening that today's motion recognises and celebrates the commitment right across Parliament to this transformative policy. We all know that the earliest years of life are crucial for every child. And we all want every single one of 
Scotland's children to grow up in a country where they feel loved, safe and respected and able to reach their full potential. Evidence tells us that if our early learning and childcare offer is to give children the best start in life and contribute to closing the poverty-related attainment gap, it has to be of high quality. A child's statutory funded hours must also be free at the point of access so that no child is held back due to household circumstances. We don't shy away from the scale of the challenge we face together in achieving our ambition for 2020. No single part of the system can achieve this alone. Meaningful and genuine partnership working is fundamental to the success of this expansion. We want parents and carers to be able to choose from a range of setting types, offering different patterns of provision and all of which meet the national standard. And that means local authorities working in partnership with a range of early learning and childcare settings, in addition to the nurseries that they run in-house. Now, partnership working isn't always easy, but it's testament to the commitment, passion and determination of nurseries, childminders, representative organisations and local authorities right across Scotland that we're making good progress together in our preparations for August 2020. Certainly. Ian Gray. No, I agree that the best way of uh, respecting the commitment, for example, of the uh, NDNA, a representative body, is by listening to what they're saying about the problems. Minister. I certainly do agree, and I meet regularly with representative bodies, and I'm meeting with Parmina Sukana from the uh, National Day Nursery Association later this month. We've put in place a joint delivery board to oversee progress across all aspects of the 1140 hours expansion. I chair this board jointly with the COSLA spokesperson for children and young people. And the work of that board is informed by regular submission of data and intelligence from local authorities on progress with delivery in a number of key areas. We published the first report on progress in December 2018, showing that local authorities are broadly meeting forecasts for delivery progress and remain on track to deliver. It's important to be clear that the expanded entitlement to 1140 hours will come into force from August 2020 onwards. Legislation to underpin the expanded entitlement will be brought forward to the parliament later this session. We're on a journey to 2020. Local authorities have been asked to phase in the expanded offer and to ensure that those children who stand to gain the most from extra funded early learning and childcare are the first to benefit. Yes. Oliver Mundell. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Does she not accept uh, that it's a bit insulting to some nurseries when she says we're on a journey when they're being asked to deliver 1140 hours now and are not receiving enough money to cover the cost of doing that? Minister. As I said, I'm, I meet regularly with private nurseries. I was in a private nursery on Monday this week. I met last week with people from private nurseries who are members of the 2020 Together We Can group. My door is open. I am more than happy to hear and I'm more than happy to work with them and improve the partnership relationship with local authorities. <laughs> Certainly I will. Uh, Minister Liz Smith. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, Minister, you said uh, in the... Uh, last debate on this issue that quality and I quote you quality sits front and center of our vision and that's something that we all aspire to we're getting a lot of evidence just now that the independent and the voluntary and the private sector does not feel that they can deliver that quality because your policy doesn't give them sufficient investment minister so I'm very confident with the multi-year funding um, that we agreed last year with the local authorities. I'm very confident that the rates will increase and that they will be sustainable and it will be deliverable. We can achieve this policy by 2020. The transition period is hugely important in allowing time for local authorities and partners to work together to refine local plans for 1140 hours. It's unfair to accuse local authorities of failing to achieve the ambition of 1140 hours already, with 18 months until the full national rollout. Yes, I'll give way. I'm very grateful John to the Scott. for giving way. Is the Minister aware that Child Watch in North Ear, in my constituency, is about to close in March, due in part to poor funding rates being provided of £3.50 per hour by South Ayrshire Council? Would the minister be able to intervene in this case, which means the loss of this facility, this vital facility, serving approximately 200 children? 
please. Minister. So I'm, sure, I, I'm, I'm more than happy to meet with the member and discuss that and to hear more detail for him. I can't comment on the individual case. It's not one that I'm aware of, but I'm more than happy to, to hear from him and work with him to solve that. But it, I tell you, today is an opportunity for me to share with the Parliament some examples of positive progress in partnership working. At our early learning and childcare, um, it, I, I've, I'll, I'll talk about North Lanarkshire because last time we debated this, this, they were very much the focus of everyone's attention. They've made incredible progress in strengthening partnership work, working, which has led to all funded providers in the area being involved in the fail, phased rollout of 1140 hours from August 2019. North Lanarkshire have also invested additional revenue funding from the Scottish Government in creating a new grant scheme, just as you asked for, which is supporting private providers to prepare for 1140 hours. We have ambitious aspirations to help ensure that our children can realise their full potential. Neither COSLA nor the Scottish Government underestimates the scale of the challenge involved in achieving our ambition but we are committed to working in meaningful and genuine partnership to achieve that ambition for 2020. Uh, could I ask you to move your amendment, Minister, please? I moved it. Moved. Thank you. I now call on Mary Fee to speak to and move amendment 16122.1. Ms Fee, five minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In opening for Scottish Labour, can I thank the Scottish Conservatives for bringing this debate back to the Chamber following a similar debate in October of last year. And at the outset, can I state our support for the policy of the Scottish Government, as we have done in the past? This debate is not about opposing the ambitions of those of, of delivering the 1140 funded hours. It's about expressing the confidence that we have in the Scottish Government to meet the 2020 deadline that delivers for children and families with the backing of all early years providers. And our confidence in the delivery is not because we have a dislike for any one party or any one organisation. It is based on the feedback that we receive from providers, from parents and from bodies like the NDNA and from Audit Scotland. And Scottish Labour believes that childcare should be flexible, affordable and of high quality for all ages, all year round. The delivery of 1140 funded hours is an important step in meeting the needs of parents and of children. And I will repeat what I said in October, that our childcare system is in need of urgent reform. The current system is not one that would ever be designed from scratch. However, we are at a point where the Scottish Government's policy can only be delivered using the current mix of providers, and it is vital that we address the problems and the issues that remain for those providers. And the flexibility of the policy is of particular concern. And although the Scottish Government want to leave it for local authorities and partner providers to decide how flexible a service that they provide, we have to ensure that this does not lead to a postcode lottery with regards to the type of early learning and childcare service that parents and carers can access. And partner providers have once again contacted me ahead of this debate. And I appreciate all of their comments and concerns that they have reasonably set out. And at the heart of these concerns is a frustration at the lack of parity between private providers and council providers. And first of all, there is a postcode lottery across Scotland, with local authorities setting a different rate for funded providers. The NDNA are calling on the Scottish Government to rerun the Ipsos Murray survey originally carried out in 2016, that identified a sustainable rate of £5.31. But by the time this policy is fully introduced, this figure will be four years out of date and is based on the 600 hours of funded hours model. And that is grotesquely unfair in the private nursery sector, who are expected to pay the living wage to staff delivering the funded entitlement. And further to this, there have been concerns raised that the current plans for expansion could lead to a two-tier system, whereby some early learning and childcare providers pay the living wage and some do not. Instead, it should be the case that there is parity between providers when it comes to wages, as well as terms and conditions. 
And Unison and the STTUC have also highlighted disparity in pay between the private, the voluntary and public sectors. With Unison questioning why early years practitioners would put themselves through training for less pay than jobs requiring less qualifications. And, Presiding Officer, at the heart of our amendment is an acknowledgement that local authorities are under severe financial pressure to deliver a range of public services. Although a £1 billion deal has been agreed between COSLA and the Scottish Government to deliver this policy, we have concerns that any underfunding to councils to deliver this policy will have major consequences on other services that are delivered by councils. And, presiding officer, if we are serious about tackling the poverty-related attainment gap, then we must be serious about addressing the wider issues of poverty. We need to address jobs growth, jobs quality and low wages. Otherwise, the policy of the 1140 hours won't do anything to address the problems that affect children of the lowest earners. And that, presiding officer, should be a priority for everyone in this chamber. And, presiding officer, I move the amendment in Ian Gray's name. Thank you very much. And I call on Tavish Scott to open, please, four minutes, Mr Scott. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I think it is entirely reasonable for Parliament to press Government on the implementation uh, of this broadly agreed uh, policy, given the scale of the monies that are to be invested in this area uh, and, indeed, the challenge of implementation. Uh, there is a big difference, as uh, many, role, uh, many know, that between ministerial visits and endless meetings and the actual action needed uh, to make a policy work. This debate, after all, wouldn't be necessary if MSPs of all political persuasions and right across the Parliament were not hearing of the practical concerns that exist uh, right now. And one of those came up uh, this morning at the Education uh, Committee of this Parliament when uh, the members of that committee heard evidence uh, on an inquiry into uh, additional support needs. And when asked about the training that was taking place into the, the uh, staff, or for the staff, uh, who undertake early uh, childcare, uh, early learning, uh, and across the uh, sector. Uh, the witnesses could not provide any, uh, or were not aware, rather, of any training uh, or support uh, for this. Now, um, if this policy is to work, one of the aspects that does strike me as important, given that one in six children in an average uh, P1 class right across Scotland have some additional support needs or other, is that the progress into that primary one class through uh, early learning uh, will allow for better monitoring and better uh, flagging up of those uh, young people's uh, needs. Uh, and yet, as, as far as I understand, and I'll be happy to be corrected on this uh, as ministers wind up this debate, it doesn't appear to be that that issue has been uh, addressed at all. So there are numerous issues uh, that uh, uh, have come to light since this policy uh, was announced. And it is not clear uh, to Parliament, never mind to all the practitioners, that they have yet been fully addressed. Just as recently as January, uh, reports illustrated that private nurseries were pulling out of council funding arrangements for three and four year olds, four year olds on the basis that the new extended hours scheme offered by the government was not uh, financially uh, viable. Nurses, nurseries complained that the government funding would not cover staffing costs and they were barred from asking parents to top up fees uh, to make that uh, difference. And that point has just been clarified across the front uh, bench. Edinburgh Council have confirmed that two nurseries have announced their intention to end that partnership from 2020. And Willie Rennie told me just before this debate that the, the nursery in Cowden Beast, where he used to send his son before he went to school, uh, closed uh, last week, again citing the challenges of losing their staff uh, to the, uh, to the uh, council uh, nursery. And again, as Alison House rightly said, who can, blame, uh, uh, who can blame people for choosing to move uh, on uh, when there is a better salary to be uh, gained elsewhere. And that's a really significant challenge, uh, not just, I suspect, in Fife, not just in Edinburgh, but right across the country. I certainly know it's a very significant challenge in Shetland as well. And the government are going to have to find uh, some way to uh, address that. Uh, Strathclyde University's uh, Professor Alain uh, Wendy Dunlop uh, from their School of Education said the other day that if the government has the ambition to put equity for all children with a closing the gap agenda, they can't afford any further attrition in early years teachers' numbers. And that seems to me a pretty fair assessment of the situation. 
In January also, Edinburgh Council announced their plans to replace nursery teachers with early years practitioners to save money and tackle teacher shortages. So there are a raft of issues that are pretty evident uh, to what is uh, currently uh, going on. I therefore hope that the government will accept the representations that are being made to members from such organisations as the Scottish Child Minders Association, recognising there has been a 4% decrease in the number of child minders between 17 and 18, and look to make some serious proposals to address these issues before this policy becomes literally too difficult to implement. Thank you very much, Mr Scott. Open debate. Speeches of four minutes. There's a little time in hand for interventions. I call Liz Smith to be followed by Claire Adamson. Ms Smith, please. Uh, thank you. Um, the Minister said uh, unequivocally in her BBC radio interview this morning, and she's repeated it again this afternoon, that she's wholly confident uh, that this policy will be delivered and delivered uh, on time. But in the debate in October, uh, the Minister admitted that there were uh, several problems. So I'm, I'm keen in her summing up if she could uh, explain to the Parliament what it is that convinces her that this policy will be delivered in light of the evidence that I think uh, all parties, including the SNP, uh, are getting from uh, the various uh, private, voluntary and independent providers. And uh, we come back to what the uh, National Day Nurseries Association said about the lower rates that are being paid uh, to private to partnership providers, the lack of access to the capital funding, uh, the lack of in full involvement of the private, voluntary and independent sector, um, but also about the imbalance uh, that they believe exists because local authorities are much more likely to want uh, to concentrate on the three and four year old provision from which it's much easier to deliver economies of scale and cost savings in comparison to the staff intensive uh, one and two year old provision. And that's, that's an issue that's very much coming uh, to the fore uh, as we speak. Now, of course. Minister. So simply to reassure the member that the first tranche of data that we looked at um, showed that actually we were ahead of what, where we were expecting in terms of recruiting two-year-olds. So 26% more two-year-olds in the system currently than we were anticipating at this stage. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, but that is at odds with what we are being told by many in the... In, in the but they are, they are making the claim, Minister, very strongly, very strongly, uh, that they do not feel they're in a position uh, to be able to deliver this policy. And, Minister, you've said several times over that the Scottish Government and COSLA are working very hard on this policy to ensure uh, that it will be delivered. But we're finding, and I'm sure that's true for the other political parties in this chamber, that the actual evidence is pointing in the other direction. And here we are when... Well, you're, you're shaking your head, Minister, but... I have to tell you that there are, we have a lot of casework. In fact, we could give you uh, a whole chapter in base. We could spend all day in this Parliament debating a lot of the uh, casework that we're getting. And we have people like Mrs. Alex Hems at the St George's Nursery uh, that um, my colleague Alison uh, Harris mentioned, who are actually withdrawing from partnerships. Now, that surely is not a good basis on which this policy uh, can be formed. And can I just be very clear, Minister, if we are trying to deliver... Uh, greater choice and greater flexibility, which I think is what we all want to be able uh, to do. Does the Scottish Government recognise that if we don't sort some of these issues, that the very opposite is going to happen? And if it's a level playing field, Minister, that you're wanting, can I ask what update we have uh, on providing uh, some answer to the fact that there is this discriminatory anomaly which will see non-profit making charitable nurseries in the independent school sector be liable to be hit by the withdrawal of the business rates relief when a private sector provider, which in theory could be making profits, be entitled to that business rates relief. Not only does that make no logical sense, but it doesn't help in terms of the choice and the provision, especially if some of these uh, groups are going to be pulling out of the policy. And I'd be very interested again in the Minister's summing up if she could uh, tell us a little bit about that. Because if we accept that there is a very significant supply and demand issue here, what this Parliament is telling the Scottish Government is that on the supply side, we are not confident, as the Minister seems to be, that there will be the ability to deliver this policy either on time, but with the flexibility and the choice, and most importantly, with the quality that is what parents are wanting. Uh, and that's something, I think, uh, Minister, that you really uh, must address. So I'll finish my uh, remarks uh, at this point. Um, but, Minister, in your summing up, I would be grateful if you could address these, because I think they really bother an awful lot of people in the private, voluntary and independent sector. Thank you. I call Claire Adamson to be followed by Joanne Lamont. Ms Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, 
Uh, I am delighted to speak in this debate, as I did in the last debate um, when this was brought to the Parliament, having just recently at that time joined the Education and Skills Committee. Um, one of my first um, duties as convener of that was to attend a forum in Rutherglen Town Hall on the 29th of October last year, um, where we were um, uh, ha had an opportunity to speak with private sector providers, with local authorities, with um, childminders, and, and with parents who, who had an, a, a concern and an issue and wanted to, to feed into uh, the committee's um, scrutiny of this area. And I have to say that, you know, um, I think when we have a debate like today, it's, it's quite often easy to forget um, at what struck me at that meeting was the overwhelming support from everyone in the room for the delivery of 1140 hours and how this was such a transformative, ambitious and welcome policy of the Scottish Government uh, and one we know has to be delivered in partnership. And what I've been really, really glad to hear um, from, from the Minister today is that even some of the issues that were raised at that forum, um, some of the concerns that have been echoed in the chamber today, but, but, but action was taken at that time. And the, the minister listened to, to, to the concerns of childminders and private providers and the introduction of the early learning uh, um, a childcare partnership forum, I think, is a really welcome way forward for people to feed into this process. Um, we also got to remember that in the delivery of this really um, a transformative policy in childcare for Scotland, um, we're also protecting the interests of the people who are delivering this and absolutely um, ensuring that everyone who's working in this area to deliver the policy ambitions of the Scottish Government will be paid the real living wage. And I think that's highly important to remember that. Also, the number of modern apprenticeships and apprenticeship opportunities that are being given to um, young people, both um, young men and young women, and there's a, a concerted effort to improve the, the number of young men coming into this area. And, and I think um, when we think of, of the opportunities that, and the doors that out opens for young people uh, in taking up a career in care is really important. And the Minister mentioned North Lanarkshire Council and the, the changes that they have made in the last year. Um, and I also want to commend them on the, the introduction of their Care Academy, where they are actively um, going into schools and speaking to young people about the possibility of foundation apprenticeships, modern apprenticeships and opportunities in the care sector going forward. I think it's very important. I'm sorry, I won't take an intervention today. It's a very short debate um, and uh, I really want to, to, to make some progress. So um, following the trials, um, which were discussed at length at that meeting, um, the government did um, produce the um, report on the trials and the evaluation found that the expansion was positively received by staff and parents and highlighted the importance of good communications with parents, sharing practice and building relationships and partner providers, including childminders. Uh, the evaluation stated that the focus on high quality professional learning for the existing and new ALC workforce is essential. And I believe that still is at the heart of this process. It's about quality, it's about delivering a really um, beneficial service to our young people. And I agree uh, with Travis Scott, it's absolutely important that we do scrutinise this process and the government's delivery in this model. But as the minister said, it is a journey and we're learning from it. And I think the most important thing I've heard this afternoon is the minister saying, her door is open to anyone with these concerns and she will be meeting with the private pr um, providers um, in the near future. And I think it's really important that progress is made in this area. Thank you. I call Joanne Lamont, followed by Rona Mackay. Ms Lamont, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I am happy to contribute briefly to this debate on um, early years provision. But I would reflect again, as I did the last time the opposition brought a debate on education, that we really do need to see the government giving some of its time to discussing the wide range of issues uh, in relation to education and childcare. So we're not all constrained in what we can do, but have that deeper conversation. I can I say to Claire Adamson, I think the easy bit is signing up to the policy. The easy bit is to say, yes, we're in favour of increased provision. The challenge is to make sure that that is actually deliverable. Um, and, you know, for the government minister, just to say there is no problem, when we're all being told there is a problem, is simply not good enough. If you want meaningful partnership, you don't just put in a motion to urge yourself and others 
to work tirelessly to promote meaningful partnership working across the country. Why the Scottish Government feels the need to encourage itself to seek uh, meaningful partnership working, I don't know. But meaningful partnership means listening to people, responding to them, and believing if they're saying it's a problem, that needs to be addressed. Now, some of this may simply be about negotiations with the private sector and the voluntary sector. I respect that. But there is no doubt from the representations that have been made to me and others, there is a problem here. It may be an unintended consequence, but it's not sufficient for the minister to cross her fingers, hope for the best, and say, if we all believe enough, this will happen. We know that Audit Scotland has raised concerns. We know that local authorities have raised concerns, the voluntary sector, the private sector, childcare groups, the very groups formed to um, impose on the public mind the need for a change in childcare provision. They're all highlighting issues and you really need to address them. If we're going to rely on private and voluntary sector providers to deliver on the hours that we all seek, we, we need to have confidence that they're able to do what is asked of them. That the way in which their funding is provided is accurate and meaningful, but it's also equally important that pressure on local authorities is properly understood. And it ca cannot possibly be the case that you can cut millions of pounds from local authorities like Glasgow and then expect them to uh, take on extra burdens and the kinds of burdens that are represented by this transformation in childcare. We do need to understand the benefits of increased hours, but the two different policy purposes here in the time that I've got, I want to address them separately. We want to support parents and carers to work. Too many families working in fragile work. The mother works during the day as a nurse, the father works at night as a taxi driver. This kind of provision could be transformative for them and therefore it's essential that it's flexible and available locally to people and that will be the challenge. And the half day provision too often given in the past by local authorities is not good enough. But there's also another policy imperative that the Minister herself has highlighted and just talked about the importance of the benefit of this policy in closing the poverty attainment gap as a consequence of the increase in hours. But simply offering the hours is not enough for some of our most vulnerable children and families. To be clear, a policy of increasing hours without a proper and effective strategy for reaching these families whose children would most benefit from early learning will not contribute to closing the attainment gap if you don't do that work. They will not simply fetch up at the nursery and the owner. I'd be interested, has any analysis been done already where there is an increased provision, the extent to which those, the poorest families are actually taking that up, or indeed the most vulnerable? Because I think that's critical in terms of actually closing the attainment gap. It is a contradiction in policy terms to increase hours, but at the same time through cutting local government funding, losing the services which can work with the most vulnerable families in our communities. I'm proud of the work done, for example, by Homestar Glasgow South and the Carers Centre and others who support vulnerable families to access services. But we know there is an increased pressure on these groups and there are limited resources and they are chasing funding at the very time where their intervention could make most difference. So in conclusion, if this policy is to be poverty-proofed, it needs to be put in the context of broader spending decisions made by this government. And I would urge the Minister, given her own thank commitment you. on childcare, to ensure that those choices are yes. also addressed. No, as thank well you as very much. Thank you. Rona Mackay, followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We know that the transformational policy of rolling out free, flexible childcare to 11.40 hours will bring phenomenal benefits and huge opportunities for children and families throughout Scotland. No one can argue that giving children the best quality early years education is a bad thing. And I think it's agreed across the chamber that giving parents the choice to shape childcare to suit their lifestyles can only be a good thing. Alison Harris's motion states that there is a growing concern between private, voluntary and independent providers with regard to the implementation of policy. As I said in the debate we held on this subject last autumn, a project of this size and complexity was never going to be plain sailing during the planning stages with so many variables between local authorities at play and I don't think anyone would reasonably expect it to be otherwise. During that debate we did hear of a disconnect between some private care providers and local authorities and I certainly have witnessed that in my own constituency. However, at a meeting last month with the Early Years and Education Director at Eastern Bartonshire Council, I was reassured that much progress had been made on these issues and it's on track to ironing out remaining issues. 
Most private partnerships are now on board and happy with how the rollout is progressing. And I'm genuinely sorry to hear that this is not happening in other areas. And I agree with Mary Fee's comments that this should not become a postcode lottery. So it might not be perfect, and there certainly were teething problems in my constituency, but regular meetings with stakeholders and focus groups, uh, that is better communication, has largely sorted this out. I believe it's incumbent on us as MSPs to engage with local authorities if we aren't already doing so in our constituency or regions to follow progress in issues involving the rollout. I'm aware that some private providers have concerns, particularly about the agreed rate being offered from local authorities, and I hope this can be resolved quickly. During my visits to private providers, I learned that while they want to pay the living wage, for some, the funding allocation makes this difficult. They also had concerns that pay was leading to an exodus of trained staff moving to local authorities. The government have been at pains to stress that private providers should be in equal partnership with local authorities, and we know that they're vital in ensuring this rollout succeeds. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has engaged with the independent school sector throughout this process. But as we've heard, two independent schools have, had, have announced their intention to withdraw from partnership from August 2020, as they'll be able to, uh, unable to charge parents the top-up fees. The fact is, as we know now, it's unlawful to charge parents and carers top-up fees for a child statutory early learning and child care hours. This is the long-standing legal position, and it's laid out clearly in statutory guidance. Uh, yes. I, I, I understand it's the legal position, but does the member understand that it's a practical position? It's very difficult for nurseries to provide uh, care for children when they're not getting enough funding to pay their staff and uh, keep the nursery open. Rona Mackay. Of course, I do understand that, but the, 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 the law, the guidelines are there and the, there's, there's, there's no way, they ha there has to be other arrangements to, made to help uh, those, those nurseries. And I do understand the difficulty that they're in. Um, as the Minister said, the, these guidelines will be re reiterated in the new sta national standard for early learning providers to be introduced from August 2020. Parents and carers should not be required to pay top-up fees or buy additional hours in order to access their child's funded early years entitlement. So in conclusion, presiding officer, the government is on track to deliver despite the, the, the issues that are still prevailing. And as I've said before, failure is not an option in, in this uh, in this initiative, but we have to work together to make this happen. This is going to transform family lives and give our children the best possible start in life. Thank you. I call Brian Whittle, be followed by Fult McGregor. Mr McGregor, we're the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Whittle, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'm grateful to once again have the opportunity to debate the early years childcare policy. Deputy Presiding Officer, the right policy poorly implemented. How often do we hear that in political discussions? However, this is such a crucial piece of legislation with such far-reaching consequences. In so many ways, the Scottish Government doesn't have the luxury of not getting this right first time. And just to be clear, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Scottish Conservative serves fully support the principles of this bill, just as the partnership nurseries welcome the bill's intention. The problem is, of course, uh, as the Scottish Conservatives have brought to this chamber on many occasions, the good intentions of the bill are not being consistently reflected in practice on the ground. Partnership after partnership nursery has raised the issue, their concerns and issues with members across this chamber, as we've heard today. And if the Minister will remember, Alison Harris and I tried to bring these concerns directly to the Minister by arranging a meeting between partnership nurseries representing 24 local council areas and herself. This is far too important to play party politics. And with that in mind, we thought it would be much more likely that the Minister would respond constructively if we kept politics out of it. However, the Minister had the audacity to suggest that her colleagues, that would be Alison Harris and I, just didn't understand the nuances of the policy. How condescending, Deputy Presiding Officer. Well, Minister, let me tell you that we do understand the issues all too well. Why? Because we in these benches continue to listen to what the partnership nurseries are saying. We understand that the inequalities in pay structure between council-run facilities and partnership nurseries are causing the mass exodus of qualified and dedicated staff from partnership nurseries to council nurseries. If you look at the advertisements for childcare by councils, it is too obvious that there is a lack of equality in the eyes of certain councils with a lack of information for parents on the variety of options available to them. Exactly the opposite of what the Scottish Government claimed to be delivering. Choice. The Minister confirmed this herself. 
We understand in some cases decades of quality childcare provided by the partnership nurseries is under threat. We understand if we lose partnership nurseries, that quality will be very, very difficult to replace. And more fundamentally, we understand that without the full integration of the partnership nurseries, this policy cannot be successful. We have experienced staff leaving partnership nurseries with a long-term relationship with the children in their charge to the detriment of all concerned. And most concerning for me will be the ability of the childcare sector to ensure adequate cover for under three-year-olds, impacting those parents who want to go back to work, as Liz Smith has, has highlighted. The care inspectorate are downgrading nurseries because of the turnover of staff, and there's nothing the partnership nurseries can do about it. They have to accept what rates, funding rates they are given. However, we also understand in listening to the partnership nurseries, we know they feel sidelined, ignored, and treated like an afterthought in the whole process. There is a huge disparity of approach across councils. In South Ayrshire, for example, we now hear that the 1140 hours will be available for families from SMD1 areas and perhaps some SMD2. Some nurseries have no children in those areas, so will be excluded. That is not what your policy document says should happen. So let us be clear here, Deputy Presiding Officer. This is a Scottish Government policy not being properly implemented as per the Scottish Government's framework. You cannot duck responsibility here and just leave it to the councils to deliver. This is a crucial piece of legislation. The policy must work first time round. There is no time to tinker around the edges because if the Scottish Government do not get it right first time round, when they come back to try again, they will find the partnership infrastructure so crucial to the success of this policy has collapsed. It's time for the Minister and the SNP Government to get their heads out of the sand and listen to what's actually happening on the ground and make the, the changes to this policy it needs to be successful. Until you do, the Scottish Conservatives will continue to give the partnership nurseries and the parents the voice they need and will continue to press the Minister and the Scottish Government to accept its responsibility. Thank you. I call Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Now, I'm going to start by um, talking about a visit they undertook on Monday of this week to Townhead Primary School in my constituency. And it's clear from that visit that they have a very strong early years ethos and promote outdoor learning as an example of this. And I, I was privileged actually to be taking a tour of the, the facilities by the very enthusiastic uh, Ms Cowan. We also spoke about the potential development of a new local authority, authority nursery on campus, which seems generally welcomed by the community and, and will meet the needs of uh, youngsters in the area. And this is just one example of the amazing work uh, going on in early years across my constituency and of course Scotland as a whole. And I do need to mention uh, my, my own wee boys nursery, who I can't thank enough for all that they do. And the Scottish Government, as, as the Minister um, outlined in her remarks, is clearly making notable progress towards implementing the fully funded 1140 hours of early learning and childcare expansion. And as others have said, the, the Scottish Government found that the overwhelming majority of parents are satisfied with the quality of funded provision and benefits for their children. The data that has been gathered shows that we are currently on track to deliver this ambitious aim. And despite a short, um, slight shortfall in recruitment, we are still on track. And over 11,000 children are enjoying access to more than 600 hours of learning. The shortfall in recruitment is a, is a factor that has been tackled uh, by the government. And, yeah, you know, there is, there's been a bit of talk about the vacancies uh, rate. Uh, it's below the national average with around 11,000 additional workers um, being required. But I welcome some of the, the, the initiatives that the government have, have set up. I welcome, for example, the, the Men in Early Years Challenge uh, Fund, which will seek to attract more males into the profession via funding for colleges. I also applaud the Scottish Government um, working on the, the 1,500 additional places on HNC courses for 2018, 2019. And we will also see more practitioners being, becoming trained up through vocational training routes well in place at nurseries across the country. And we also have a, a national recruitment campaign that will attract school leavers and those looking for a, a different uh, career path. And this is all good news, but from the Tory speeches in, in motion today, you, you wouldn't think that there's any good news at all. And that, that brings me on to, to say that, you know, that, that there are, of course, difficulties. I think that the Minister uh, has, um, has outlined them and other speakers. Um, even within the, the, the SNP benches have also outlined them too. And I, I, I've talked in here about Lock View and Park View nurseries, uh, excellent facilities uh, in my constituency. I mentioned them in here uh, before, and I agree with what the Minister and, and my colleague uh, Claire Adamson have said, that um, over the last few months, North Lanarkshire Council are an example of a, a council who ha have turned round 
their engagement with the, the, the private sector. I don't think I'm going to have time over. Um, they're, they're, they've turned around their engagement with the, um, the, 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 the private sector nurseries to the extent that, that they're now working together. But you know, even just in discussion uh, with the, um, the manager of that nursery today, um, they're still um, raising concerns over, as uh, I think uh, Alison Harris uh, ha had raised, around the, um, the, the, the disparity of wages between the, the, the private sector and the, um, the, the local authority sector, and that's something that they're looking for the, the council to try and address uh, through these discussions. President officer, I, I want to also um, conclude by giving mention to the Give Them Time campaign and how this fits into this motion. Uh, it was a motion um, that, I, that I recently um, uh, put forward, and, and I thank members for signing. I'd also like to take this opportunity on record to thank the minister for her engagement with the group. And this campaign is based on a, a fairly simple principle. The choice to defer a child to P1 uh, is, is for the parents or carers and not local authorities. They're not campaigning for children for that for deferral to happen automatically. They're just campaigning for the choice to be um, the, the, the choice, the, the choice where it lies. But unfortunately, parental experience of this is inconsistent across local authorities, with many being uh, quite negative and obstructive in terms of funded nursery placements for children of parents who choose to defer. And I'll get into this in more detail um, uh, if I'm lucky enough to get a member's debate on the issue. But in the meantime, we'll uh, have to wait your member's local debate. Local authorities must apply Mr. the law as it stands. Please and surely, with the new 1140 hours, uh, they I'm can being nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> for the time being. I call on Ian Gray to close for Labour, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As uh, many members have uh, mentioned, this is a debate we've had before as recently uh, as October. And it is a pity uh, that we do have to keep uh, returning to it because the Minister was right when she said uh, that there's much agreement across the Chamber uh, that uh, uh, high quality, uh, flexible, affordable childcare is critical and the expansion to 1140 uh, hours is a uh, a policy that's, that, that's supported, I think, right across uh, the chamber. There's agreement, too, uh, that that will have to be uh, provided by a mix of different providers if it is to be delivered at all, uh, but also if it's to be delivered with a degree of flexibility, which parents uh, will wish to see. And there's agreement, too, that this means we, we need to pursue uh, common standards, common level, levels of training and, and qualification. Uh, and indeed the payment of the real living wage for those delivering uh, funded hours, whatever sector they are uh, working in. We also, I think, agree with something that the Minister said this morning on GMS, which is that delivery of this uh, is challenging. Uh, indeed, I think uh, many of uh, the speakers today have been trying to say that although they agree with the Minister, they think that's rather a bit of an understatement. It's extremely challenging. And, you know, there are some authoritative voices who agree with that. Audit Scotland, who, as we know, expressed considerable concerns, particularly about the ability to recruit the required uh, workforce. And I think that they are doing uh, an update on that work, and it'll be interesting to see what they say. Uh, Unison, who organise, of course, in the sector and have raised concerns about the disparity in wage levels uh, in the public and private sectors and the consequences uh, uh, of that, which I think is also featured in this debate. And of course, we have the NDNA who are still telling us uh, that around half of their members are saying they won't be able to be involved in this 11-40-hour uh, hour expansion at all. But we don't really need the NDNA to tell us that because, of course, all of us have nurseries uh, in our constituencies who are telling us uh, all of the things that have been uh, discussed and debated today. Here's uh, one nursery from a colleague's constituency uh, who tell her that over the past 18 months they've lost three of their most qualified staff uh, to uh, the, the state sector because they're pursuing uh, better pay. He here's another colleague who has an email from a partner provider nursery talking about three local authorities, contiguous local authorities, uh, all with similar demography and socio-economic uh, profile uh, offering a th a, a partner providers the difference between 4.76 uh, pence an hour and £5.55 an hour. That's quite a significant uh, difference there. And you can understand why they are concerned by that. And they're also being offered different numbers of hours in transition. So uh, there, are, there, 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 are, there are problems here, voices raising real concerns. And Joanne Lamont is right. 
It isn't good enough to just shrug these off. And we do have to understand that although there is an agreement with COSLA uh, about funding for this policy, it, it is less than the sum of what individual authorities ask for in their plans. And we have to understand the context of local government at the moment, which is about squeezed budgets. All this debate asks is for some acknowledgement of all of this. The minister has said repeatedly her door is open. The trouble is her ears and her mind seems to be closed uh, to some of the problems that we're being told exist. Both the Tory motion and our amendment, they're measured and mild to say the least. They don't denounce the policy. They don't demand that ministers be dragged to the tumbrils so that we can see heads roll. They just ask for a little humility a willingness to listen to the concerns and the evidence of councils and providers, to acknowledge them mm -hmm. and to seek to address these problems before they compromise this policy, which does command support across the whole chamber. Surely that's not too much to ask. Thank you. I call on Marie Todd to close for the government. Minister, please. Thank you. And um, let me give, begin by assuring you that I am listening and that I am willing to address all of these problems which are being mentioned today in the Chamber. Thank you to colleagues across the Parliament for today's debate. As I said earlier, it is heartening that hearing throughout today's debate, we've heard that shared commitment across Parliament to this transformative policy ambition. We're 18 months away from a national rollout of 1140 hours for all three and four year olds and eligible two year olds. And we're on a journey together with our partners in local government and in early learning and childcare settings, the length and breadth of Scotland. I do not underestimate the challenges involved, but I am determined and I am confident that together we will deliver for Scotland's children and families, certainly. Liz Smith. I'm grateful for that. Could the Minister provide to the Parliament the evidence that makes her feel confident that this will be delivered on time? Because I think that would be very helpful if we could have that evidence, given the conflicting evidence that we're getting from our casework. Minister. Absolutely. There's been much discussion this afternoon about what progress the data does or doesn't show. And I would point colleagues to the Early Learning and Child Care Expansion Delivery Progress Reports published by the Joint Delivery Board. And that board's working along with the Improvement Service and the Scottish Futures Trust to collect data on the progress of the delivery of expansion programmes across all councils. That's a rich data set covering all aspects of the expansion. The first of these reports was published in December 2018, covering the period from May the 1st to September 2018. And that did demonstrate that local authorities are broadly meeting forecasts for delivery progress and remain on track to deliver. And indeed, the number of children already benefiting from additional hours is exceeding local authority projections. I'm hugely proud that over 11,000 children are already benefiting from access to more than 600 hours of funded early learning and childcare, including 1,100 eligible two-year-olds. That's 26%, one moment, 26% higher than we anticipated. We are already hearing about the positive impacts for children, their families and practitioners working with them. Yes. Michelle Balancing. Um, I understand what the Minister is saying about the rich data set and the numbers that she's got, but does she know how many children are waiting to go into the 1140 hours and of that number, how many places are still available in local authority places and how much is reliant on the private sector? Because that's where your gap is. Minister. So let me assure the member that at the moment, at the start of this expansion, the proportion of the market which the partner providers occupied was around 23%. At the time of the completion of the expansion, it will be around 23%. And in the meantime, we have not committed to delivering 1140 hours until 2020. Now, to, give, to answer um, Ms Lamont's point about Glasgow City Coun Council, they signed off plans last, um, just very recently to accelerate the expansion of early learning and childcare. And from August this year, families with a household income of up to £45,000, that's 90% of families in the area, will be able to access 900 hours of funded early learning and childcare in local authority and private settings. I think everyone in the chamber will nurture 
early, everyone in the chamber, certainly I expect my colleagues on this side to welcome the fact that the up to 8,000 staff will benefit from um, those working in 960 partner provider settings will benefit from um, a real living wage, a largely female workforce. With regard to the point regarding ASN training that um, Mr Scott raised, there's a £2 million inclusion fund which allows settings to bid for funding to support children with additional support needs and to access ELC. And there's funds for staff to receive appropriate training, equipment and adaptations. The most most recent funding round closed on the 22nd of February. With regard to the um, point raised by my Conservative colleagues about the rates relief for independent school nurseries, um, at the moment the non-domestic rates um, bill um, may well will remove this re relief, ending the inequality, which um, is frankly unfair that independent schools, which are charities that benefit from non-domestic rates, um, charity relief, and council schools do not qualify. So that will be ended. We did introduce, though, could I finish this point? We did introduce 100% can I finish this point? We did introduce a 100% business rates relief for premises which are wholly or mainly used as day nurseries in April 2018, and that will remain unchanged. Yes. Uh, I would suggest not. Uh, you're in your last minute. You okay. must conclude. I'm okay. Sorry. I want to take the opportunity then to express my appreciation for the valuable contribution made by the national representative organisations. As I said in one of the interventions, I look forward to meeting the chief executive of the National Day Nurseries Association later this month, continue dialogue with the um, colleagues at Early Years Scotland, including speaking at their conference later this year. Later this month, the Scottish Childminding Association, the Care and Learning Alliance and the Care Inspectorate will all support a dedicated summit for local authority colleagues on involving child minders in the 1140 offer. It's a hugely important area in terms of flexibility and choice for families and I'm grateful to all of these organisations for their involvement. My door is open to anyone who wants to talk about early learning and childcare. In my role I have the opportunity to visit settings right across Scotland on a regular basis and it is incredibly valuable to hear it first hand about progress and challenges. And there you must conclude. Thank you Thank very you. much. I now call Lord Mundell to close for the Conservatives. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to close this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Uh, the message from today's debate is clear, that this uh, flagship policy is under pressure. And um, as with many issues under this government, the rhetoric coming from the Minister doesn't match the reality on the ground. And I say gently, because I don't want to make this too political, but you can, on the one hand, try and claim credit for a noble policy ambition, and on the other hand, just ignore its shortcomings and challenges. This is government at its worst and parents and young people deserve better and it's time for the Minister to take responsibility for ensuring that 11.40 hours is the success so many families in Scotland need it to be. The problem is that the Minister has ignored the problems from members right across this chamber that we've been raising over the last year and the task is becoming harder and harder because trust is breaking down. We've heard numerous examples this afternoon, but I'll focus on a few from my own constituency, which I think do sum up the debate we're having. It's all very well to say that this policy is going well in some places, but the point is this is meant to be about universal access to 11.40 hours in every local authority in Scotland. One nursery owner got in touch with me ahead of today's debate to say that the situation in Dumfries and Galloway is fraught. There is no consultation, nor any trust or partnership. We are committed to performing high quality early learning and childcare, but unless something is done, there's a high chance of us going out of business. Meanwhile, another nursery has been in touch with me to tell me that they've been turned down uh, to offer funded places because the local authority has taken the decision not to commission any new providers uh, while where there's an existing local authority nursery. This is despite having invested thousands of pounds in opening a new nursery following the closure of the only other childcare facility in the town and they are meeting an otherwise unmet need of working parents. An angry and confused parent has been in touch with me. Yep. Minister. Just on that particular issue, in Dumfries and Galloway, the share of provision and partner providers and childminders at the start of this expansion in 2016-17 was 38%. 
at the time of completion in 2021-22, the share is expected to increase to 40%. And of course, the number of hours available will be greater. Mr Mundell. I, I thank the Minister for that intervention, but that gets right to the nub of the issue. If these partner providers aren't there, your policy will fail. And it, I can see uh, it's all very well talking it up, but as an angry parent who's been in touch with me says, the refusal to allow this nursery to open and offer funded places when they're the only provider offering 51 weeks of the year is discriminatory to single parents and that there are people who will not be able to go to work because it's impossible to obtain the childcare they've been promised. Absolutely. Another parent believes that the nursery in question is best placed to deliver outcomes for their child who requires additional support and will benefit from being in a smaller environment. But the next uh, issue is perhaps even worse, uh, where a nursery has been told that their business lease is to be terminated, uh, which is in part of a school uh, that they've operated in for 13 years. When they asked why their business lease was being terminated, it turns out it's to make room for a local authority nursery. These uh, three examples follow a case I've raised with the Minister uh, before uh, Christmas, where there was a nursery in Annan uh, who was being asked to deliver 11.40 hours in January. At uh, four o'clock on the 21st of December, they were still trying to find out from the council what their funded rates would be. That doesn't sound like partnership working to me, Minister. And I've chosen not to name the nurseries in question because I don't want to alarm parents still further, but I wonder if the Minister would be willing to personally investigate these unresolved cases and give a guarantee that the policy delivered on the ground is the same policy the Government uh, have announced. I also wonder if the Minister would accept that such serious issues and failings at this stage, so systematically within one local authority, is enough of a problem uh, for the Scottish Government to step in or are we just meant to wait until it's too late? Even the Scottish Government's own uh, Deputy Director of Early uh, Learning and Childcare appears to recognise the problem. And in a recent email to Directors of Education said, and I quote, there is a continuing sense at forum meetings that not all providers feel they're being equally treated by their commissioning local authorities. And that same uh, official was concerned to hear that the national standard requirements were being incorrectly interpreted in some areas. If this really is a national policy, when are we going to see national leadership from the Scottish Government to iron out these differences and ensure that the whole sector is valued and that the existing skill base and talents offered by the private and voluntary sector are put to maximum use? In conclusion, uh, Presiding Officer, the time for warm words uh, and positive aspirations is over. If this policy is going to deliver on its potential, we need action. We need firm commitments uh, from uh, the Minister that she is going to intervene and get this policy back on track. The question is, is the Minister ready to take full ownership of this policy or would they rather blame individual local authorities and focus on regional inconsistencies? I know that like the Scottish Conservatives, parents and young people would rather just see the policy fixed and I would urge the Chamber to support our motion at decision time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mundell. That concludes the debate on early years, and it's time to move on to the next item of business. I'll have a short pause while the front bench uh, members take their positions for the next debate.